Your neurologist reviews your MRI and says your MS is stable, but is it really? Many people with MS, even younger people with relapsing MS, can have subtle worsening of symptoms over time, which may be even unnoticed. This is so-called smoldering multiple sclerosis. And there's evidence that relapses and new MRI lesions may not be the best markers of multiple sclerosis stability. And there's this subtle inflammation within existing stable appearing lesions, at least on conventional MRI, that's driving this subtle decline over time. And maybe we have to shift our treatments to target this smoldering inflammation, the so-called real multiple sclerosis. And I want to take a look at an article reviewing the evidence for smoldering multiple sclerosis. Some of the authors include Professor Gavin Giovanoni and the physician scientist Dr. Kirsten Helwig. And we'll look at the evidence for this phenomenon and then move to potential future treatments, which may make our overall treatment of MS much better. Let's have some fun. I'll start with a few quotes from the article. They say, we challenge the dominant clinical radiologic worldview that defines multiple sclerosis as a focal inflammatory disease of the central nervous system. The real MS is in fact driven primarily by a smoldering pathological process. In other words, they're saying looking for new lesions on conventional MRI, looking for clinical relapses, you're missing the big picture, the underlying disease that's driving long-term disability in MS. We propose that focal inflammation occurs in response to the cause of MS, that is, the real disease. In other words, new MRI lesions that enhance or relapses that result in major clinical symptoms, these are secondary factors not as important as the underlying smoldering disease. I'll explain exactly what they mean. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And if you enjoy the video, please click like. So I'll include the link to the article in the description below if you want to check it out for yourself. But let's review some of the evidence for this phenomenon that they provide. For one, relapses and new MRI lesions correlate only modestly with overall long-term disability progression. Certainly, you could have a relapse and not fully recover and get worse. This is relapse-associated worsening, or RAW, and that does occur. But believe it or not, the majority of progression in MS is independent of relapses. This is known as PIRA, or progression independent of relapse activity. Also, progressive forms of MS, both SPMS, secondary progressive MS, in other words, people with a history of relapsing MS, and PPMS, primary progressive MS, people who do not have a history of relapsing MS, they seem to be the same disease. And there's a lot of evidence that MS is overall the same disease regardless of the clinical phenotype. For instance, SPMS and PPMS demonstrate roughly equal amounts of inflammatory infiltrates based on autopsy studies and roughly equal amounts of axonal loss and the rate of disability accumulation, although it varies tremendously from person to person, on the average is the same between these two conditions. And people with progressive MS who have superimposed relapses don't really do worse on average, so do relapses really matter that much? Also, there's this idea that as people get older, maybe they have higher levels of disability, multiple sclerosis is kind of burnt out. There isn't a lot of inflammation. We don't see a lot of change on MRI. So maybe it's not inflammation that's driving disability in those individuals. And maybe it's something else like axonal failure or mitochondrial failure. But there is, in fact, ongoing inflammation and demyelination, even in so-called end-stage MS. In other words, older people who've had MS for a lot of time, long time, who have a significant amount of disability. In fact, one such autopsy study on people with MS for a long time, in fact, a mean duration of MS of 29 years, found that 78% had chronic active lesions. So even older people who have no relapses, no new MRI lesions on conventional MRI, they still have inflammation in the disease. It may just be focal and trapped within the central nervous system. So let's look at the actual data on the correlation between relapses and long-term disability in MS. So early in MS, there's very strong evidence that relapses do matter. This is an old study looking at relapses during year one and two after symptom onset and how strongly they correlate 
with time to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. In other words, how long does it take on average to develop progressive multiple sclerosis? Keep in mind that MS on the average is becoming milder over time, so these numbers look really bad, but the prognosis overall is getting somewhat better. So if you look at people who had one relapse in the first two years, it took on average 20 years to develop progressive MS. For people with two relapses in the first two years, it was 16.7 years, and for people who had three or more relapses, Relapses, it was 15.1 years. So people who have three or more relapses compared to people who have only one relapse, they develop secondary progressive MS on average five years earlier. That's a really, really big difference. But what if you look at relapses later on? This is looking at the number of relapses from year three to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So after the first two years. Now the scale they're using is disability status scale, DSS, sometimes known as EDSS, or expanded disability status scale. I have a separate video on this if you wanna check it out. But basically DSS-6 means a cane is required to walk 100 meters. DSS-8 means a wheelchair is required, roughly speaking. DSS-10 is death due to multiple sclerosis. So strangely and counterintuitively, the more relapses people had, the better they seem to do. So one relapse, two relapses, three, four, five, you can see the probability of needing a cane or a wheelchair goes down and down and down. Now this is really strange and counterintuitive. So what exactly is happening here? Well, it's not that relapses are good, of course, that they're bad. It's just that generally, Generally speaking, relapsing MS is better than progressive MS. So people who have relapses, they are less likely to have this steady, slow progression. And even if you have a relapse, you have a good chance to improve and get better. Whereas if you have that slower, steady progression, you're sort of less likely to dramatically improve, although there are certainly rare exceptions. The other thing, of course, is sort of a reverse causation where if you develop progressive MS very early on, you sort of have less of a chance to rack up more relapses on this chart because it's the time from year three to secondary progressive MS. So if you develop secondary progressive MS early on, you have sort of less years that are being measured here. So what exactly is causing smoldering multiple sclerosis? Well, this is an autopsy study on someone with so-called inactive progressive multiple sclerosis. And staining reveals the presence of these microglia. These are resident macrophages of the central nervous system. These are not B or T cells. They're not even even part of the adaptive immune system known to be initiating inflammation in multiple sclerosis at all. They're part of the innate immune system. So drugs such as B cell depleters, Ocrevus, do not deplete these cells. Gelenia does not entrap these cells in the lymph nodes. And that may be why smoldering inflammation is sort of resistant to our treatments. And it may be why we need a totally new type of treatment to target smoldering multiple sclerosis. And just to show you how important this smoldering inflammation may be, take a look at the data from the OPERA 1 and 2 studies. These are two studies in relapsing MS on the drug Ocrevus. It was compared against Rebif. I actually participated in this study a long time ago and recruited a few patients, but they looked at what amount of disability accumulation was due to relapses and what amount was so-called silent progression independent of relapse activity. And so you can see the yellow line is what we're generally focused on, relapse-associated worsening. However, the blue line is progression independent of relapse activity, and the black line is the total amount of disability accumulation. And you can see they're right on top of each other. This PIRA seems to be the dominant factor driving overall disability accumulation. The yellow line is really a minor factor, yet we're so focused on it. And so they propose this model. You can see the levels of disability on the left. So imagine that you have a relapse and you improve, and maybe you didn't get 100 percent better so you do have some RAW or relapse associated worsening but after this you get slowly worse over years this so-called smoldering multiple sclerosis which is driving PIRA or again progression independent of relapse activity now what is causing PIRA well, there may be many factors. One, of course, is in fact the adaptive immune system, the B and T cells. There may be some unique things to progressive multiple sclerosis. For instance, there's evidence of B lymphocyte follicles within the meninges in some people with progressive multiple sclerosis. Maybe some of our drugs like Ocrevus simply don't get there and that's why they're not as effective. But there may be a lot of other factors as well. One could be energy problems or mitochondrial failure. And so we need drugs that sort of compensate for this 
energy failure. The other may be the innate immune system, like the microglia I just showed you. Maybe we need other drugs that target these cells, and I'll talk a little bit about this at the end of the video. Of course, there are other factors, lifestyle factors, exercise, nutrition, sunlight exposure, maybe ongoing central nervous system infections like Epstein-Barr virus I've talked about in other videos, and maybe other retroviruses, and possibly normal aging. One theory about progressive MS is that demyelination kind of makes the axons more naked and susceptible to natural aging. So progressive MS could almost be described as sort of an accelerated aging phenomenon. Now in modern times, we don't have to wait for people to die to see if they have smoldering multiple sclerosis. Even though these changes are invisible on conventional MRI, new forms of special sequencing are detecting these so-called slowly expanding lesions associated with smoldering MS. For instance, this is a man in his late 50s with relapsing MS, and you can see these paramagnetic rim lesions, and these have been correlated on autopsy studies with CNS microglia. This is a PET scan, and this is a 48-year-old female with relapsing remitting MS, EDSS of 4.0. In other words, moderate disability, had the disease for 12 years, and you can see the activity of the microglia are essentially everywhere in a typical periventricular and subcortical distribution of MS lesions. Now, often these changes can occur even in white matter that appears normal, so-called normal appearing white matter. This is a different type of PET scanner with a different binder, and you can see a 42-year-old man without MS as a control on the top, and on the bottom a 40-year-old man with secondary progressive MS, and there are abnormalities even in the normal appearing white matter, and again based on autopsy studies, this does in fact correlate with microglia. This is a CD68 stain, which is a marker of macrophages and microglia, and you can see the inflammation is everywhere. And these Microglia in normal appearing white matter in progressive MS have been linked to microstructural damage, brain atrophy, and disability accumulation. In other words, the markers of progressive MS. And I don't mean to imply that microglia are the sole cause of progressive MS. There are certainly many other factors that have very good evidence. For instance, oxidative injury is definitely a factor. Studies have shown increases in the multiple sclerosis central nervous system of compounds such as nitric oxide or superoxide dismutase. There's also evidence of abnormal accumulation of iron in MS brains, which is neurotoxic. Mitochondrial failure is definitely a real thing. And Epstein-Barr virus may be important not just in the risk of MS, but also the prognosis of MS. For instance, EBV-infected B lymphocytes seem to be causing abnormal inflammation, even in progressive multiple sclerosis. And it may be that the adaptive immune system is still important and that it triggers and recruits components components of the innate immune system, like the microglia, to come in and cause damage. So the obvious next question is, what do we do going forward? Even if we believe in smoldering MS and we have to make a dramatic change in the way we treat the disease, what exactly do we do? Well, the article proposes that we have to change the way we measure outcomes and maybe abandon the expanded disability status scale, or EDSS, because it's too discreet and not very sensitive to the subtle, insidious changes in disability that happen in progressive multiple sclerosis over time and maybe change to the more sensitive MS functional composite for our clinical trials. I do have a separate video on this and maybe we could even use technology to help us out with smart devices that can measure things like total distance walked in a day or walking speed either through wearables or using your existing smartphone and installing a smartphone app. And we have to increasingly recognize the importance of lifestyle, diet, exercise, getting adequate sleep, avoiding too many medications, especially anticholinergics and other medications that can impair cognitive function, and measuring medical comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, increasingly recognized to correlate with worse outcome in multiple sclerosis. But what about the drugs? What about the future medical treatments of smoldering MS? Well, here are a few potential candidates. One is this very interesting class of medications called the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as mesitinib, and I do have a separate video on mesitinib, but 
but also evobrutinib or tolibrutinib. These drugs are definitely less potent as immunosuppressants compared to, say, B cell depleters, but they had the specific effect of targeting the FC gamma receptor in microglial cells, so they may have some specific benefit in progressive MS. Whether they do or not remains to be seen. We await the results of clinical trials, such as the Perseus trial for tolibrutinib. Another thing is potentially increasing the dose of Ocrevus. So Ocrevus is very effective at preventing new MRI lesions and preventing relapses, but some people, including first author of this publication, Professor Gavin Giovanoni, have speculated that maybe the dose is not optimized for preventing slow, insidious progression. Why does he say that? Well, retrospective analysis of some of the clinical trials for Ocrevus shows that people with a greater body mass index, in other words, people who are bigger and are effectively exposed to a lower dose of the drug, seem to not benefit as much in terms of disability progression, even though it's definitely very effective for people at all body mass indices regardless of their size in terms of preventing new lesions and new relapses. So maybe the standard dose, 600 milligrams, is too low and we need a higher dose such as 1200 milligrams or 1800 milligrams and research on these higher doses is ongoing. Interestingly, with the other similar drug that depletes B cells, rituximab, the opposite movement has occurred where people are suggesting that maybe the dose is too high and we should give a lower dose or give it less frequently in order to lower the risk of the medication while still retaining the benefits. So a little bit of a mixed picture in terms of data there. The other idea is a totally new type of treatment, a remyelination therapy. Part of what's driving smoldering multiple sclerosis may be the failure of remyelination. Some people with MS, they have a lot of lesions, but they get a lot of remyelination and they do very well in the long run, whereas others seem to have worse remyelination and that may leave the axons or nerve fibers naked and susceptible to degeneration and possible, possibly susceptible to the smoldering inflammation later on. So maybe we can use drugs that cause remyelination. One potential candidate agent is clomastine, and I have a separate video on clomastine. And of course, the ultimate would be combination therapy using multiple treatments to target multiple aspects of the disease, perhaps one drug that targets the adaptive immune system, another drug that targets the innate immune system, and another remyelinating agent. So in the future, the treatment of multiple sclerosis could look something like this. You have your disease-modifying therapy that's anti-inflammatory, but you also take a remyelination agent and maybe even a neuroprotection and neurorestoration agent. And in addition to that, you're doing various things to manage lifestyle, Perhaps certain diets will be proven in the future to have a disease-modifying benefit in MS. Some examples would include a whole foods plant-based diet or a paleo diet or, as Gavin Giovanoni proposes, possibly intermittent fasting or a ketogenic diet, having good exercise and sleep and managing medical comorbidities, infections, avoiding excessive medications, and potentially other drugs and social determinants of health that correlate with prognosis in MS. Anyway, I found the article to be very compelling and convincing. Now, is any one of these treatments I mentioned going to actually be successful, such as the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors? I hope so, but I can't guarantee it. It's really hard to say. But I'd love to know what did you think of the article and my presentation, and do you have any suggestions for future videos?